Hey, Sean, how's it going? Good. How are you today, Scott? I'm excellent. And I'm excited to be having this conversation. As I mentioned earlier, A Course in Miracles has been this looming thing on my radar. And I don't mean looming in a bad way, but in a way of it continues to come into my awareness through many great teachers that I have followed, like David Hawkins and Eckhart Tolle, in conversations with others. And that's how I discovered your work as someone that was writing about The Course in Miracles and teaching it on Substack. Maybe to start things off, how did A Course in Miracles come into your life? Yeah, I was, I mean, in many respects, um, I was a failed Buddhist and a sincere but confused Christian Catholic for a long time. And I remember one time I was at church with my daughter, who was at that time 40 years old, and the priest, this was during the period when um, Massachusetts was talking about gay marriage, and the priest was really talking about that as a thing that he wanted Catholics to um, be concerned about and take action against. And I remember just not feeling comfortable in that environment and comfortable to that and not feeling like this was a place that I wanted to be with my daughter. And so we just left. And that began for me a period of real loneliness. Like I was spiritually alone. I did not have a practice. I was unprepared for kind of that desert experience that can happen when um, there's a sort of emptiness, when we're looking for some meaning, when we're looking for some guidance, some way to get from one end of the day to the other with helpfulness, with grace, with kindness. And I remember that in that period that A Course in Miracles sort of floated onto my radar. And I had been aware of it in the past. Like I knew that there were folks that had studied it. You know, I kind of like you, like there was just, it would sort of pop up now and again. And I just gave it a shot. Like I literally just ordered the book and I started reading it. And the thing that happened for me in those early weeks was a kind of simultaneous recognition of this is really interesting. This is really intriguing. And also like, what actually is this? Like what, you know, what is this text? What is this, you know, this, this book that, that that was, you know, channeled by this, you know, self-described atheist psychotherapist in New York city in the sixties. Is it Jesus in the first person? Like what is going on with this? And I was kind of hooked that way in a kind of intellectual way. Like I was just genuinely curious, what is this material? And I think in part that arose because I was hungry, because I was lonely, because I had been away from a daily active spiritual practice, you know, for years. And so that was kind of the beginning of it. I did at that point, there was a point when I read, I went to the library to try to read about it and to try to find out what is this. And the only book I could find was Marion Williamson's A Return to Love, mm. which oddly contextualized the course for me. I felt like, ah, this is a kind of, you know, new age self-improvement sort of modality. Like I get it. I know what this is all about. And I stayed in that space for two months until I got to lesson 79 and 80 and 79 is, you know, let me recognize the problem so it can be solved. 80 is let me recognize the problem has been solved. I was walking with my dogs out in the woods, 4 a.m., moonlight, and I fell to my knees because I had this profound realization that the God that I had been praying to and the God that I conceptualized and that the God that I was in relationship with was an angry God, a judgmental God, mm, yes. you know, and I, I, if you had said to me, that was my God, I would have said, no, man, I'm, I'm hip. I'm smart. I'm past that. I've worked my way through. And the thing that the course did, and it was the course doing it just taught me to be honest and to look really clearly at what's going on in my spiritual life. And the reality was I was projecting a God very close to the God of like Jonathan Edwards, you know, that whole sinners in the hands of an angry God ideal. It was awful. But at the same time, there was the realization that there was something else. And the course was offering that. That's the point where I was, there was nothing else for me. And that's when I really became, in many senses, a course, a student of A Course in Miracles. That's amazing. I have so many questions to ask you. Maybe for the listeners, we can talk about what the course actually is and how it came to be just as a backdrop of some of those more deeper questions about your experience. 
So the course is a three-volume course, right? There's a text, A Course in Miracles. There's 365 lessons, one for each day of the year in a workbook. And there's a manual for teachers. Um, the material was scribed by Helen Shuckman, who was a psychologist and educator in New York City, working really closely with Bill Thetford. And she received that material over a period of about seven years. And she wrote it in a kind of shorthand and then she and, and Bill edited that material. It was edited again subsequently by Ken Wapnick, who became a really well-known teacher of the course. And essentially, the course is an, is an invitation to reframe the way that we think, the way that we understand what does it mean to be a self, what does it mean to be a self in the world, and what does it mean to be a self in relationship with other selves. It's recognizing that there's something fundamentally wrong in the way that we construe or the way that we construct our, our living. And it's an invitation to do that differently. And it really structures that around a kind of Freudian psychotherapeutic model of ego versus Holy Spirit. It really takes that kind of traditional Western concept of psychotherapy and takes in a, a, that kind of Christian concept as well from the West of um, Jesus as a healer, the Holy Spirit as a healer, and it combines those two, and it gives the student an opportunity to begin to discern between fear and the voice of ego and grace or peace, and which is the voice of the Holy Spirit, both of which are in our minds, both of which are opportunities for us, we, ways that we have of responding to the world, interpreting the world, or interpreting experience. And the material is, you know, I mean, it's a scribe text. Jesus speaks in the first person in that text. There's a tremendous amount of conflict sometimes in the course community. Is it actually the historical Jesus? Is it a projected Jesus? There's conflicts about whether it was over edited or under edited. There are many versions of it that are available at different stages of the editing process now that are out in the public. Interesting. So the course is both an opportunity to heal uh, and to go deeply into that sense of what does it mean to, you know, to be a human being, to be a mind, to have this mind and to engage with the world and with other minds, while simultaneously being a kind of fascinating cultural artifact, you know, like it's just really intriguing. Yeah. And I, and I listened to you talk about, was this channeled purely? Was it, is it a projection of, of Jesus? And I guess my thought is, is like, it doesn't really matter if it works, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if it yeah. makes you feel how you want to feel on a consistent basis with deeper levels of peace and joy and, yes. and reverence, like who gives a crap? Um, <laughs> but you know, I will say, I know that there's a lot of people that are listening to this. Like I came from a Christian background. I grew up going to church on Sundays. I too experienced a lot of programming around this God that was going to punish me for doing wrong and, you know, lots of different things I've had to unwind. And I sense that there's probably this question because of the origination coming from apparently channeling Jesus Christ that many people have, which is, is okay, well, I'm not a Christian or I don't identify with Christianity. Is this something that is really appropriate for me. And I'd be curious to hear how you think about that. That's a really interesting question. In many respects, A Course in Miracles has for me healed that sense of, of that sort of shadow side of Christianity, that sort of darkness, that the anger part of that. On the other hand, it unconditionally includes that language it includes that kind of imagery and it rests on that like it's its foundation is absolutely christian and so i think one can come to that from a space of this language has been hurtful in my life this belief system has been painful in my life and i want to try to do some healing around that then i think the course is a good place to be but i also think that if one is truly averse to that like if one is coming out of another tradition of a more eastern a buddhist a hindu tradition and feels more comfortable with another language i don't think that there's any loss in feeling like there's another path the course is really clear that there's a universal curriculum and it's one flavor of it that's it like if this is your flavor then absolutely buckle down double down take it seriously go all in but 
if for some reason it's not resonating for you, all that really means is that what does resonate for you is just down the road a bit. And there's nothing wrong with shaking the dust off our sandals and finding what works. You're absolutely right about that. You know, the course has to, the test is always, does it work? Does it help? Does it bring me more peace? Does it bring me more joy? Is that joy and that peace showing up in my relationships? Is it showing up in my communities? That's the test. Yeah. And I think this is a really important point and something that I've come to know is there is kind of like a perennial consistent philosophy or trajectory that many of these ancient wisdom teachings, religions, whatever you want to call them all point to, there is some, what of a universal principle. And it really is the you know, what version of that are we getting that has been filtered down by many men who did have self-interest as part of the process? And some of these religions or texts have been better maintained than other from the original source. And yeah, I almost, you know, I think about people in my own life. I think about like my mom, for example, who's a devout Catholic. She has that strong Christianity resonance, even though many of the things that she's encountering today in the Catholic church are not actually emblematic of many of the things that Jesus embodied. Mm -hmm. And so this perhaps might be a really interesting place to explore for people that, that are Christians, but maybe are also interested in some of these kind of more existential new age concepts that are not stressed in, in many of the modern teachings of Christianity. It's kind of like a happy middle ground of like, I remember when I started meditating and I've had certain things happen to me and people in my family were like, well, that's Buddhism and that's Hindu and that's bad. And like, it's almost like this is wrapped in a container that's approachable for lots of those audiences. That's actually a really interesting way to put it. And I think that's true. I think that it does have that that it has that ability to sort of, it integrates this concept of psychotherapy, which is, I think, really been a helpful development in the last hundred years for human beings. This idea that in dialogue together, that we can kind of go deeper into what, what we fear and that we can undo that fear. And it does integrate Christianity. So if one has that language, that inclination, there it is. But it also does have that sort of kind of new age side of it, which is, you know, you're, you're not a body and the world isn't real. And it just opens up this kind of this space of being like, you know, I want to ask some deep questions. I want to try to have the experiences that one has when one lives, when one lives in the space of asking and being willing to receive answers to those hard questions, those big questions. I think absolutely it can do that. Yeah. How has your opinion of Jesus or your perception of Jesus changed after going through the course versus when you were doing the traditional like Catholic church thing? I think that I felt very much in my, in the more traditional mode that I perceived Jesus as um, an idol, as something separate from me, generally on a cross in a, in a position of having just been painfully tortured and executed and I felt some sense of guilt. I felt some sense of obligation. And the course has helped me to reframe that. And, you know, I say this carefully because I know that this language can easily be co-opted. And But the truth is I perceive Jesus more as a brother. I perceive mm. Jesus more as an ally now. I perceive Jesus as a human being who very much like us asked hard questions and, you know, got some answers and then lived according to those answers. He lived the truth that those answers showed him, which is that there is no separation between us and God, that our brothers and our sisters, you know, are one with us in creation. And that that creates a really specific way of living and a really specific way of problem solving. And I, I perceive him as an ally in that work. I perceive him as a friend in that work. I perceive him as a brother in that work. That's amazing. My perception personally has changed from there's definitely a long period of equating Jesus with God or the son of God. And I think what I've come to believe now is we all are essentially expressions of God. And yes. Jesus was just a very highly evolved being like way before his time. It's like yeah. Buddha, Jesus, all these people were like just incredibly enlightened, evolved humans that had access to many capabilities and insights and wisdom and things that were, more direct emanations from the highest expression of consciousness. And 
And for that reason, it was so unfamiliar. It was so outlandish that they were basically perceived as gods on earth. I think that kind of like bringing Jesus back to humanity, it kind of changes things, right? Yes. It changes things and it removes lots of that guilt and shame and other things that can be so easy to essentially self-construct when it's not framed in that way. So one of the things that, just to kind of be a little bit more specific, The Course in Miracles, it's almost like, for me, the course was like a daily devotional where it was basically a page or two every day that would kind of instigate some inquiry and maybe even give you some exercises or to-dos. One of the things that it's commonly associated with is forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And I would be curious just to have you talk a little bit more about that. So forgiveness is a weird concept in the course. And I say weird carefully because it's a very beautiful concept in the course, but I think it's not a familiar concept. So our concept of forgiveness tends to be you step on my toe and I forgive you. I forgive you, Scott, you know, out of the, the, you know, the kindness, the bigness of my heart, I forgive you. And then we just sort of extrapolate that. We keep moving that up the line. Bad things happen and we forgive them. And in the course, forgiveness is a way of seeing the other as if they have not sinned. It is a way of seeing past the sin, the error, the oversight, whatever that is, whatever language that we want to use that, the wrong, the thing that happened, we don't see the brother or the sister as having caused that. We don't associate them with that. It's a will willingness to see past harm altogether. It's a willingness to see in all of the things that happen that we would say are bad, wrong, evil, or hurtful as cries for love and to respond to them as cries for love. The only response to a cry for love is love. That's the only response to that. And the love always is contingent on looking past what happened, past the exchange, past the event, and to the one that you share that experience with. And, to, and that's forgiveness. Forgiveness is the ability to see your brother or sister as God sees them, to see them in the light of creation, to see them in the light of love, to see them and to know them as a brother or sister and not as this separate being from me who does X, Y, and Z. And I like X, but I don't like Y so much. And that's a big lift. Like it's really yeah. hard to go past the event. It's very easy for most of us to say, I'm you know, I, I've spiritually evolved. I don't hold grudges. I can, you know, I'm, I'm going to forgive you for these things that you've done. And I, you know, that that's a thing that happens in the world for sure. But the course is an invitation to go a step further and to see past the possibility of harm altogether. Practically, what does doing that look like? Because <laughs> <laughs> I've just like, you know, it's just, I actually have a lot of experience with this and kind of came to the same conclusion through a different school of teachings. But I know that people listening to this are like, yeah, okay, that sounds great. But this person just ripped me off and I want to rip their head off. (laughs) So one of the things that I always, in my practice of A Course in Miracles, I'm trying to do is when I'm in that space, this person ripped me off and I want to get, you know, I want I want my money back. I want whatever it is, you know, I want the back. I want to ask myself, what has to be true for this belief system to operate? You know, what has to be real? Like, you know, so have I really lost something here? What has to be true for me to lose something? In order for that to be the case, I really truly do have to be a body. Like I have to be this body, this limited contained body. You have to be the body that you are. And there has to be a principle of scarcity that there's not enough to go around. And we've got to be in competition for this. That's a belief system that has to be in place in order for me to hold that grudge. And it feels very reasonable to hold it. I do not deny that. Our default mode is separation. Our default mode is fear. Absolutely. The course is saying challenge that. So what does it look like in practice? In practice for me, it's always that invitation to sort of to go a little bit slower with what's happening in the world in an attempt to ensure that my perspective is coming from holiness, that my perspective is coming from as best as I'm able. How does the Holy Spirit see this? How does Jesus see this? How does God see this? That's not easy to do. And sometimes in that space, when one overlooks, when one is able to perceive the other apart from the harm, 
the harm generally resolves itself, but also we realize that it's not really the harm that's causing us the problem. It's that underlying belief system that I'm a body, that I'm separate, that I have to defend myself, that my brothers and sisters, you know, are not reliable. They can't be trusted. I can't have faith in them. I want to investigate that. And that's a process that evolves in time. It's, it's a practice, very much. A practice. Definitely. The concept that you are a body and a bunch of thoughts inside of a body as a separate entity is a, a very big one. And, you know, for me, the meditation was essentially the mechanism to start to shift that, specifically understanding becoming the watcher of thoughts and mm -hmm. recognizing that there was a deep awareness that was always there that was actually separate from the constant chatter in my head. And yeah. we could do a whole episode on that. What is the kind of mechanism and way that the course helps you understand that idea that you are just a body is actually a myth? So the mechanism for the course in some ways is the daily lesson, right? Like it's the daily lesson. So you're doing these lessons. And like I said earlier, I think it's a big lift to go from this experience of being a body to this experience of you aren't a body, you know, the body, fine, whatever bodies do body things. They're there, but you aren't a body. You are, you know, you don't die. You aren't born. And I think that, you know, the course is a, you know, gives us these daily lessons, which slowly, gently shift our thinking, slowly, gently shift our thinking, invite us to be in a different relationship with the experience of perception, invite us to be a different relationship with what thought is. And I think it's a very gradual process whereby we begin to be able to discern between the ego's voice, which is always arguing, always advocating for a body and the Holy Spirit, which is always advocating for kindness, for grace, for love, which again, very much embodied experiences. But the Holy Spirit is the one that gently shifts us away from the narrow domain of self-interest and sort of opens up and expands that idea that in fact, we aren't bodies. We're closer to minds. You know, we're closer to minds and minds don't really have those containers. Minds are much more fluid, much more flow. But I don't think the course ever specifically says that. It simply invites us to have those different experiences, a different response to perception or different way of organizing and understanding these experiences that are cumulative. Over time, mm. we change. Over time, we begin to have a different perception of what it means to be a self, what it means to be in relationship. I think this is a really key point because a lot of times I think there's this notion that you just wake up and a switch <laughs> is hit that you're enlightened. And look, that can certainly happen to people. Like I was having a conversation the other day with my spiritual teacher about this concept of having to do, do work or do things to grow spiritually, whether that's actually true or not. And I think the conclusion that I came to is that for some people, it's not true. For some people, you just wake up on a bench and you, <laughs> and yes, you yes. perceive the deeper truths of reality. And for other people, there is some type of process that one has to engage with, or at least they perceive that they have to do that. And you know, I think this notion of everything kind of being on a continuum really resonates with me, mm -hmm. where it's like these gradual doors of perception are shifting. And then- mm -hmm. It's less of a light switch, but more of the aha or recognition mm -hmm. that comes through where it's like, oh my God, there's nothing going on in my mind or like, <laughs> oh my gosh, like I am an awareness yeah, yeah. and it just kind of hits you like a light bulb moment, but the changes in perception have been ongoing and it's more of the, the recognition that is the, like the light bulb moment. A Course in Miracles uses the analogy of awakening and, and uses literally that concept of that slow process of awakening. Like, you know, you're kind of like the, that space between the dream and then when you're sort of easing into the world, you're coming to the light changes a little bit. You sort of sift into this new reality, this you know, you're waking up from the dream. You're sort of waking up gradually and slowly into, into this new reality, this new understanding. For some people, yeah, it's like that. They hop out of bed, you know, they're, they're ready to go. And then for some people, it takes time. How has your body experience changed as you've developed less of an association that I am a body? I may be misunderstanding. So bear, so, you know, steer me back if I'm going in the wrong place. 
mostly what the course has done for me has introduced a greater level of calm as I have no longer associated as intensely with the body. Therefore, the body's interests, the body's needs feel less pressing to me. They're easier to meet. If they aren't met, it's easier to let that go. It's easier to be patient with that. So it has very much been about a shift in identity away from the body, a shift in identity away from being a body, which I think has brought about peace because the body in its sort of anxiety, its drives, um, identification with that creates a lot of conflict. But I'm not sure if that's exactly what that's you That's exactly what I was asking. Oh, okay. And, you know, I have a similar experience. It's kind of also how I view the ego, frankly, which is like, it's not that it goes away. It's like you still acknowledge it. It still has its things, but because there is a separation versus just pure identification with it, it makes it just like less tolerable. It's kind of like the body sometimes is like a bratty little kid and like, oh God, there it goes again you know, you're so fussy versus this like crisis inducing thing that I must build up and I must maintain and like is emblematic of me, which is, I think is very common in our society where it's like, oh, I have a great body. I'm great. Yep. Absolutely. Another fascinating phenomena that I have experienced in addition to just the greater peace, and this might be, I don't know how consistent this is, but like recognizing that, you know, the consciousness or you are not limited to the spatial plane that the body exists on. Absolutely. Yeah. I've had plenty of experiences of things like remote viewing or like just getting all kinds of information that effectively was not limited to where I was in this experience, where the body was. And that was like a crazy unlock for me where it's like, oh my God, like the belief system of me and the body is like limiting the, essentially the plane of reality and information that I have access to. Yeah. I I think a lot of people don't realize the extent to which this sort of experience of three dimensions in time are very much a reflection of a body. It's, it is the body. Like it's just, you know, and if you stop associating with the body, if you stop identifying with the body, then the, your perception naturally begins to include other domains. It just does because the, you know, the body is presenting a very, very narrow perspective on what reality actually is, you know, very, very restricted view of that. Yeah. One of the other things I that seems to be kind of a principal concept in the course is fear. There was a quote in a recent article that you put out that I love, which I think I want to unpack a little bit, which is fear is a thing we make, love is what we are. <laughs> and no one likes fear, but no. for some reason we all freaking have it, right? Um, and so what do you make of that? Like, why are we in this interesting position and what can we do to untangle it? So I think that fear is a thing that happens in bodies, right? And as I I think I use the example in that article about the, you know, a strange dog kind of rushed somebody and they panicked and that's just bodies being bodies. There's no crisis in that. That's not a problem. But when we identify with that fear, when we sort of psychologically become entangled with that fear and we start to feel like, you know, that fear is a reflection of who we are. We're judging ourselves for fear. I think we start to get confused. And then I think we start to elevate and we start to create these additional fears. Am I fitting in at my place of employment well enough? What's my role in the family? How does society look at me? Am I wearing the right clothes? Like the whole thing, this fear of I'm not enough, that this fear that I'm going to die, this fear that I'm going to be hurt, all of those fears are very much associated with the body. Those are things that uh, happen in bodies. We take those fears and we run with them. Like we take that and we run with that. We make it so much more complicated and difficult than it has to be. The suggestion is that way down at the bottom, way, way down at the bottom, almost beyond our capacity to perceive creation, love, cooperation, that, you know, that very fundamental principle is what brings us forth. We're aspects and elements of creation and creation doesn't have fear in it. Creation doesn't. Creation is perfect. It is perfect. You know, and the fear comes when I separate. The fear comes when I isolate because that's when I start to feel like, 
oh my God, I have to protect myself. I've got to look out for myself. I can't trust people. I forget that there's oneness. I forget that there's unity and I lose that. So fear is a decision that we make. And the course is really clear about that. Fear is a decision to be separate and to accept the effects and consequences of separation. One doesn't have to accept that. One can go back and, as the Course says at the very end in its penultimate chapter, choose again. Choose love. Choose unity. You know, Choose the end of fear. You can do that. We can do that. Yeah. I think it's a pretty radical concept because so much of what we're programmed in society to believe is that like fear is a fundamental human condition and that it yeah. aids our survival. And I guess- to your point, the requisite condition for that to be true is that you're a body. Yeah. It's like, well, what if, what if you're not a body? Then like, <laughs> it doesn't matter what happens as, as alarming of a statement as that might be. It is a radical disarming statement. It's a hard thing to say. And, um, it's tough. Like, like I, you can't say that to just anybody, but it's a concept that's worth investigating in our living. How does fear arise in my life? What does it do to me? Do I want it? Do I need it? Do I have some say in this? You know, is there some way to not experience this? And the answer to those questions is yes. You don't have to be scared, you know? And I would just kind of chime in with my own two cents here that like, it's a continuum of experience where at least for me, like I wasn't like I woke up one day and never had fear, but over time, what happened is essentially developing an acuity of recognizing fear as it arises, not identifying with it, watching it, seeing it, and then letting it pass through. It's kind of like uh, if a bird landed on a tree in front of me and then the bird flew away, it's like, that's just all it is. It's like, yeah. there's nothing really to get all worked up about. You know, it kind of becomes that experience with increasing frequency and consistency. Yeah, A Course in Miracles, that's a great point because A Course in Miracles is very consistent that our work is to notice the fear. We don't have to do anything to the fear. The bird analogy is lovely. You have to look at it. You have to notice it. You know, you have to own that part of it, but you don't, you aren't personally responsible for healing it. You just have to observe. The healing part of it happens at another level. And that's what's so cool is, is that the healing, the natural tendency of consciousness, I guess, is to move towards healing. And I would say the same with the body too. It's like, eventually you realize that like, all you have to do is get out of the way. Yes. And that was a huge learning for me because for a long time, I applied so much drivenness to my spiritual awakening mm -hmm. where it was like very much a Protestant work ethic of it's like, the more that I do, the better I'll grow, the faster it will happen. And there's no question that there was a little bit of that served me for a while, but eventually sure. there was a recognition that like, wait a second, like who is the one that needs to do all this work? Right. That's just the ego, the mastermind in another, <laughs> in another form. Right. And it was just like crazy to see like all of this healing basically emerged naturally once I just allowed it. It was like, oh my God, like my trying was blocking it. Yes. Which yes. is so fucking counterintuitive. <laughs> but also, so it's like the most beautiful thing. It's like the most beautiful revelation when that, those type of experiences. Yeah. Healing is the natural, it's our natural function. Loving is our natural function. It just is, you know, it's really wild and it's really beautiful to see that and then to lean into it and start to practice it. Absolutely. And this to me is, is why I'm so passionate about talking about this because the hero's journey of understanding and awareness of all of this is just the most magical, awe-inspiring thing there is. It's better than having a house, like a zillion houses and nice cars. Right. It's better than being famous. It's better than anything I could possibly imagine right. because the like consistent revelation is so enriching. Yeah. And I feel for myself, and I think it's a sort of an offshoot of practicing the course is that partly of that reward, that sense of joy is because it's real, you know, the, right. the fame, the fortune, 
that that comes and goes, you know, it's f- fine. Have it, don't have it. I, I, I don't care. But there is a joy. There's a way of being that's really natural. That's reality itself. And it's really, really beautiful to make contact with that. Absolutely. What would you say the biggest inflection point point or points were for you as you went through the course? So you mentioned that chapter 79, 80, when you fell to your mm-hmm. knees, that sounds like a big one. Yeah. Were there other ones? There was for me um, a moment when I, Tara Singh is the person that I, I read and most closely. And Tara Singh was deceased when I began studying the course. I never met him or worked with him at all. But I read uh, his one of his books. I think it was Nothing Real Can Be Threatened. And in the second or third sentence of the introduction, he said, I wanted to find out if nothing real can be threatened, nothing unreal exists, can be brought into application. And I felt like that's it. Like, because that's a core concept. The course says the peace of God is inherent in that. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. I could understand that as an idea to be debated, but Tara Singh was the one who said, let's actually see if it works. Let's live this. Let's try to actually get into the world, into this life, and find out if it's true. That changed my life. Like that, you know, that was at some point after the lessons 79 and 80. That was like turbocharging. I was in at that point. I was committed to the course, but my gosh, he just absolutely, it it was like scales falling. I just felt like I was like seeing the night sky for the first time or something. It was so amazing. And it was really that, you know, that deep desire that, you know, we are on this path. Like, again, you and I are talking about this many, you know, the many ways to study this, many ways to be on this path of healing and love, joy, and of fear. But, you know, for me, Tara Singh was the one who sort of like took my hand and it it really pulled me forward. And that was a profound moment. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Can we live that? Can we actually live that? Not debate it, talk about it, analyze it. Can we live it? Can it be our reality? And so to just kind of unpack that a little bit, it's essentially saying unreal, fear is unreal as an example. And Mm -hmm. so it cannot be exist and the realness, which is the love, which is our natural state, mm-hmm. it is impossible for that to not be. It cannot be threatened. It can't be threatened, can't be killed, can't be harmed, can't be taken away. Just can't be. Can't be. You know, and the challenge becomes for most of us, that's, you know, it's puzzling. What can that possibly mean? And, and, you know, to the extent that we're, you know, identified with a body, it's baffling because bodies can be threatened all the time. They can be threatened by viruses. They can be threatened by falls, you know, like they can be, it's just awful. Like, you know, the body is under assault constantly. Yet the suggestion was there's something real here. There's something about this, you know, this experience of being that is beyond the reach of harm beyond the reach of harm. And anything that you believe is harmful, anytime you fall into that fear, that's just unreality. That's not real. And what's not real has no effects. It doesn't have any effects. You know, it's just a dream, a bad mm-hmm. dream, but a dream from which we can awaken. What is your experience like, your day-to-day experience like now? How is that <laughs> different than maybe before you started this work? So I think there's a greater sense of peace and there's a much greater ability to discern between fear and love. Um, It's a process. I practice like it's, I'm not, you know, there's no suggestion here about being at the end of anything or enlightened or anything like that. It's just that, you know, I feel this profound awareness of the gift, you know, the gift of love, which I think inheres in creation to call it a gift is a little weird. It's sort of, implies there's an actual giver out there. I think it's more that creation itself is a gift and that we are aspects of that and that there's no cause for fear. There's no cause for hate. And it's very, very beautiful, you know, to be part of that. And that infuses the day-to-day life. Like I stop more to notice things which are very beautiful. I have more ability to do that. I don't feel anywhere near as driven around um, success models that the world offers me. I think I'm a better listener. I think it's absolutely unconditionally made me a better dad. Like in all those ways, it opens up the capacity to be present to the world and to be present to life, to be present to all of that with more grace, more openness. That's beautiful. You know, coming from an intensely driven background myself where I was effectively trying to be perfect at everything (laughs) for most of my life, there's a good book that I read recently called 4,000 Weeks. 
the title is essentially the average human life has 4,000 weeks. And I talked about this notion that this experience is nothing but a series of moments that we're on. And effectively, it was kind of talking about productivity, and which is, uh, to me, a form of fear. <laughs> it's like, if that is what this is, then the ability to enjoy those moments is such an incredible gift ability to be and like be a part of those moments fully is like, that is what this is. Like that is the prize. Like there is no destination. It's like, it is right now Mm -hmm. and that's it. And like, to me, that was like a really poignant part of that book and shift for me right? Versus the constant preparation for some more compelling experience or more safety or whatever it is that was effectively running my experience before. Mm -hmm. And so it's very cool to hear that you have something similar. One question that I have for you is um, this notion around like a lot of people listening to this are devout seekers, Like Mm -hmm. they are on the path and there is this like concept of like, I need to do more meditation or I need to practice or I need to read more books to ultimately reach what you are talking about, which is somewhat in conflict with this notion that you're already it. Yeah. Like you don't need to do a damn thing. And practically people hear that and are probably like, well, what do I do? And, (laughs) and so how would you as a teacher of the course and from the reference point of the course, talk about that dynamic? So I think to the extent that one is experiencing themselves in the stage of seeking where you want to consume a lot of material, I, I think that's a phase that one goes through in my experience. You've talked about that. We, I've talked Same. about that. So on some level, you know, I, in fact, I said this to someone yesterday, I'm like, lean in. Like if, if that's where you're at, man, then lean into it. Like live, if that's what the Holy Spirit is calling you to do to, you know, to just read everything, meditate more, to go for it. But the real thing that the course invites us to do is to try to sort of be present to what's the motivation for that? What's the voice that's guiding you to that? When you're feeling like I have to meditate more, is that coming from a place of love or is that coming from a place of fear? Be honest about it. It, be rigorous about it. You know, skip the morning meditation, sit quietly and really ask yourself, is it the voice of love or is it the voice of fear that's demanding that I do this? And I think one of the things that happens in, you know, for those of us who study and practice the course, we get good at recognizing when we're being called by fear and when we're being called by love. And we begin to want to respond only to the call for love. Love doesn't argue. Love doesn't punish. Love doesn't, you know, it's not asking us to be workhorses. It doesn't withhold its gifts. Love is always what's present. And I think as we get better at hearing that, at trusting that, we can lean back a little bit into the moment as it appears, which may or may not include a rigorous spiritual practice. It may not. It may. I mean, you know, what's given? What's appearing? But the real question is always, you know, with respect to my response, with respect to my presence to this, it, am I being called by love or am I being called by fear? I want to really get good at understanding that distinction so that I can respond to love. Yeah, that's amazing and very congruent with my experience where lots of the spiritual work was effectively a expression of trying to control, trying to be yeah. safe because there was this idea that basically – if I become enlightened or if I do the right spiritual work, then I will avoid harm, which is uh, definitely emblematic of, you know, identification with the body and you basically an unreal self-imposed threat. It took me a very, very long time to come to that realization, mm-hmm. but um, huge unlock when that yeah. arose because then the, the experience just becomes... I would say more spontaneous, right? It's yes. like, yep. you know, you feel like meditating, like go meditate. Like it's not right or yes. wrong. It's just whatever. Like you want to yes. skip meditation and you want to go, 
read a trashy TV like novel, like whatever, like go yep. do that. And there yes. isn't a sense of militantness about about things. Yeah. Well, Sean, this has been a fantastic conversation. You know, I know that this is, I mean, is this is what you do for a living, right? You teach the course. Is that correct? I do teach the course, yeah. That's awesome. And so for the people that are out there that are listening that perhaps want to engage more with the course or with you, like what is the best way for them to do that? Um, they can reach me through my website, seanregan.com, and that's got a link to my Substack, um, which a lot of people find helpful. But there's a lot of writing, a lot of video and stuff at my website, which can be really helpful if you're interested in engaging. Absolutely. I'll link to that in the show notes. So for everybody listening, you can find all that there. I've been following Sean's work for a while. I really enjoy it. I think it's a really, really unique perspective and relatable articulation of some of these kind of deep, deep concepts. And so if that sounds interesting to you, I would encourage you to just check out Sean's Substack. But thanks again, man. This has been yeah. such a fun conversation and yeah. we're very grateful for everyone listening as well. And uh, we're grateful for you, Sean. Thank you, Scott. Great to be here. Thank you.